for it TV. The world is thinking. Well, I got interested in, in the, the wine ratings partly as a as a uh, person who likes to drink wine, but a scotch is okay too. Uh, um, and and I was you know I would judge wines by their ratings you know because I'm just basically an ignoramus so you know and and and. You know, but I got to wondering, they charge a lot more if it's a 93 not, than if it's an 88 or an 89. And, you know, how much meaning people put a lot of, um, I, I remember reading in one magazine that, that it's worth a lot of money, each, each, each point on the rating system. So I thought... You, I, you're referring to the uh, Robert Parker ratings, I see. Right. But every, I mean, he's not the only one yeah. who does it anymore, but he was the first one. Uh, and and um, so I was wondering what's really to this. And first of all, from the point of view of, of uh, statistics... When, when you're measuring something, if you're, even if you're measuring, say, the position of a star in the sky, if you're an astronomer, and this is how some of the statistics was first uh, invented and why it was worked on, was where they would measure the position of a star, and the same astronomer could measure that position 10 times and get slightly different answers. And the different astronomers, obviously, they'll also get different answers, and they're wondering how do these answers distribute themselves, or since this is statistics, not probability, we want to go backwards, what's the underlying truth? So what is the actual position of the star now that I have all these readings? So I'm saying, what's the actual position of the wine now that I have all these ratings, right? And, I, and, I, and, I, and there hasn't been any study on that, and there's not enough to get a good data sample if there were 30 or 40, if I could get 30 or 40 um, good ratings for every wine, I could probably you know, get some idea. But there are, of course, user ratings on the internet that you could use, but that's another. What I did was I looked at it theoretically, and I said, well, how, let's, let's see how the, uh, if there's any studies about how, good, how well people can actually discern these things. And um, so there's a lot of studies like that, but the ones that relate to expectation, they're pretty amazing. Um, so you give people, um, let's say, uh, white wine that's dyed red you know, with a tasteless dye, odorless, tasteless dye, and guess what? The wine connoisseurs rate it with tannins and you know, all the red thing. Or you, 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 take, um, you take identical wine that's, um, that's white and you dye it to look like rosé, and you ask how sweet it is, they'll rate it as sweeter than when it's not dyed. Um, I've, they've also found that, that when they, you know how when you read the wines, there's all these different tastes that, you know, 35 different things from sweaty socks and, you know, perfume and, you know, chocolate chips, grapefruit, you know. Uh, people even uh, they, they, they studied perfume experts and even they could only do about three and when you're having four or five six different flavors and, and, and when you don't have an expectation then it's really hard people would mistake like a dirty sock for an orange I mean it, it's it's uh, so you can th those studies are interesting to read but the most fun one is it was done at, at Caltech and I think partially at Stanford um, in a collaboration but they they took students. These weren't connoisseurs. Uh, well, they, you know, they like Boone's Farm, if, if you're from that generation, or <laughs> Two Buck Chuck, I should say. But, but, but they, they gave them a lineup of wines, and they labeled them by price. They want to, these were economists doing this, so they want to see the, the uh, effect of expectations. And, and, in, and, of course, they lied to them, as they always do. So, so they, they didn't, what they didn't know was they were lying about the prices. Uh, most of the prices were right, but one bottle was a $90 bottle, which appeared twice, once labeled... Well, I, they, someone's raising their eyebrow in the audience. That's, you know, they get grants for that. So <laughs> <laughs> they, they got they an extra 90 bucks on their grant because they could finish the rest of the wine. So, so, so um, but, but wait to the punchline is they, they really don't need the $90 bottle because here's what happened. So they, they labeled the $90 bottle 90 and they had it appear again and they labeled it 10 the second time, right? And then they asked the students to taste the wine and, 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 and tell how much they like the wine. Well, guess what? They like the $10 bottle um, a lot less than they like the $90 bottle, right? Yeah. And that, that's kind of amusing, and, and uh, you know, on its own, it would almost be obvious, but still something you might want to confirm that expectations matter. But here's the punchline: is that they, the students weren't just sitting at some table doing this; they were in an MRI machine having their brains imaged, and the scientists found that actually the pleasure center of their brains actually did light up more with the bottle when it was labeled 90 than the same bottle when it was labeled 10. So they, they really were enjoying it more, and. The, <laughs> The moral of the story is, you know, invite your friends over, stick that $90 label on the $10 <laughs> bottle, and they'll love two-buck chuck just as much as anything else. <laughs>